everyone. Welcome to another episode of Inspire with Carrie. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm so excited to have our guest. She is so accomplished, attorney Takora Davis. She is the founder and CEO of the Creators Law Firm. And I'm gonna brag on her a little bit. She's on the Forbes Next 1000. Her law firm is the 11th fastest growing law firm in the United States. Um, she's been featured in Black Enterprise, NBC News, VH1, Facebook Community Boost, Google, and much more. And I'm really excited to learn, and for all of us to learn together about her journey and how she got here. And I think it's really going to inspire us. So without further ado, attorney Takora Davis, I want to kind of start from the beginning. How did you get into this field? Because if I'm not mistaken, you have a degree in biology. I do. <laughs> okay, so how did, how did, I, you can start from as far in the beginning as you want. How did you get into this field? Oh gosh, okay, so um, in undergrad, I was pursuing a biology degree because I would ultimately wanted to be an ophthalmologist. So I wanted to be a doctor or a laser eye, a laser eye surgeon. And so um, along that journey and path, I just kind of, really realized I was not a big fan of science and you know the doctor you really need to love that area right. and I just kept trying to force myself to do something that ultimately I didn't want to do because I thought this will make my parents proud um, and so <laughs> really in my senior year I realized like this is not what I want to do I'm gonna get this degree anyway right. but ultimately not what I desire and I was in my plant physiology lab and I was doing a very big research project on pyrococcus which is an extreme heat thermophile. Ultimately, it's I was trying to increase the heat tolerance in tomatoes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Random, okay? And so my, my lab... Uh, lab director her name was dr wendy boss and she kept saying we need scientists in washington and then i started to learn that the women in the lab they had created um plant patents and i'm like well, what's a patent and they're like oh this is an invention and we own the rights to it or the university does and then i started to understand that oh there is a, a area of law called intellectual property and specifically patent law and so i didn't i just thought if you wanted to be a lawyer you had to have like a political science degree um i didn't understand that oh that there's no prerequisite for law school like medical school where you have to take certain amounts of science credits and so it really began to open up my eyes to something that I didn't even think was a possibility to me I'd actually always said I wanted to be a lawyer even when I was in fourth grade I saw Johnny Cochran at the OJ Simpson trial and I was like he oh like <laughs> yeah 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 very charismatic right right <laughs> and so uh I was very shy and timid growing up so uh, someone they later apologized but they were like I don't think you're strong enough to be a lawyer you know oh, and, um, yeah. you know my it was my dad he said that to me. <laughs> um, and he was saying it because I was so fragile and literally I would cry if people spoke to me I would not speak in front of people I was painfully shy and he said it and um, later he told me, I know I said this to you a really long time ago and I'm very sorry that wasn't right for me to say he apologized, but I think it just kind of took the wind out of my sails. Yeah. So I just I was like, I don't know if I can do that because my dad, you know, he's made that statement. Yeah. But when I understood like, oh, I can actually still pursue law and I could pursue this type of law. I don't have to be like a criminal attorney. I could be this intellectual property attorney. I was like, okay, this is great. So I, I went, uh, I worked on the Hill for Congressman Budge. I was previously, oh, previously. yeah, I staffed her on her science and tech committee for a little bit. I was mainly the legal assistant there. And that allowed me to realize I definitely don't want to go into politics, but <laughs> it really the one, I'm sorry to interrupt you, over HUD. Am I? Yeah, she, over HUD. she's currently over wow. HUD. Yeah, so I was with, gosh, it was like 10 years ago, like 2010 to 2011 or 20, wow. yeah, along it. Yes, yeah. And I remember getting into law school and I was like, you know, Congresswoman, I got into law school, but you know, I could stay here for like another year and work. And she was like, no, you're leaving and you're going to law school. <laughs> she was like, no. You're leaving. I was like, oh, yes, ma'am. 
ended up going. Um, and so while I was in law school, I knew the whole time I'm going to be a patent attorney. And I began to take um, a patent drafting course. And in the patent drafting course, I still, when I really got into it, I was like, oh my gosh, this sucks. This feels <laughs> like the, la- the science lab I was in, you know? So I started to realize maybe this isn't what I want to do. But in, there, in that class, um, there was a black woman and she was a trademark attorney and she came in and she gave a guest lecture. And I believe that she worked for Coca-Cola at the time. And literally when she came in, it changed my life because I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. Like how she spoke about intellectual property, how passionate she was about it and how she was speaking about the power of trade. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. And so from that moment, I was like, I want to be a trademark attorney. I never gotten the opportunity to take a trademark course outside of that mini course. I kept trying to take the trademark course that was offered at law school, but my schedule never lined up. I could never do it. Um, And then when I graduated, I took the bar. I didn't pass the bar the first time. I failed it by five points (laughs) and I was so devastated. Oh my goodness. (laughs) And a week later, I got a job as an intellectual property analyst at a healthcare startup. And they, of course, wanted me to do patent stuff. So oh my goodness. <laughs> so I was back in the patent. But the beautiful thing about that is I ended up working with over 300 inventors. And wow. so they would submit their ideas. I would assess, is this eligible to be patent protected? Right. Is this good from a marketability standpoint? Is it commercially viable? And so I kept having to do this analysis on multiple inventions and then I would speak to multiple inventors and that helped me understand like working on the hill helped me understand customer service dealing with constituents calling in and people are most of the time not happy calling their members of Congress so right. that, I've been one of those <laughs> guilty <laughs> right so that helps and then working with the inventors it helped me understand the heart and the mindset of people who create And so then I ended up just, you know, I got laid off from that job. So we're like now in 20, December of 2015. Okay. So I was pregnant with our first child. I was like four months pregnant and they're like, we're laying you off. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we had just bought a new house. Oh, (laughs) Perfect timing, right? (laughs) Yeah, you know, we were like, oh my gosh. And so my husband was like, it's fine. You can just relax and I'll take care of you and you don't have to worry about anything. And I'm like, I'm an independent woman. No, like, Um, it really bothered me. Like, he's always taking very good care of me, but I really wanted to work. And so, so I was disobedient and I went out and I interviewed for a job. I got the job at an entertainment law firm. This was like in February of 2016. So I'm like okay. five, six, six months pregnant at the time, I think. And um, it was the job from H-E-L-L. It was really, oh. really, really bad. Oh, I, don't wow. know, I, don't, I don't know if you ever had a bad boss. No, actually. <laughs> that's <You're laughs> that's a blessing. <laughs> yeah, it was a really bad work environment. And oh. like how he spoke to me, how he yelled at me, he would cuss at me. Oh, um, yeah, no, no, no. He, he would say, I don't know what you learned in school, you know, you, I don't, you know, he would talk to me like that. And I'm like, dude, we went to the same law school, like, you just graduated years ahead of me. So it was just this toxic work environment. And I knew, um, I was like, you know what, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here to learn how to practice trademark law. I'm just going to learn as much as I can from this guy. And I don't care what he says to me. I'm not going to let it affect me or my baby, you know. Right. And, uh, but that was my plan. But he literally taught me nothing about trademarks. So he treated me basically like a legal secretary. Oh. So I would answer phones. I would put files together. He would say, how can I run my office more efficiently? And then I would go and I would say, hey, you can do this. This could be a better system for the firm. And he would say, I don't want to do it that way. And I'm like, or he would tell me to go research something else. And I said, here's some solutions. And he would shut down all of my solutions. I literally didn't understand. I was like, I, God, why am I here? Because he didn't mean to me. I I still have not gained any skills in terms of trademark law. 
I don't know what's happening, but, um, and then I had my son, went on maternity leave, had my son. And when my son was 10 days old, the guy called me. Now keep in mind, before I say this, I was broke. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good enough, yeah. <laughs> Just had a baby. And, um, you know, I was kind of was desperate. Kind of felt like this was my only choice. And so he calls me and I'm like, hey, I can get back to work in like maybe four or six weeks, you know? And he's like, yeah, I thought about it. Um, I no longer think you're fit for the success of this firm. I think you need to focus on healing your body and get over your pregnancy brain. So your so services your will no longer be needed. Be what? <laughs> Yeah, and so people are like, why didn't you sue him? I was like, I have no money to sue nobody. <laughs> and it's my word against his, like I know what it's like to litigate. And so um, I then, you know, still knowing that, that I wanted to serve entrepreneurs and creatives, still feeling like I haven't had real experience. I then started to do like contract legal work. It's called the review. You know, it's like purgatory for lawyers, you know, <laughs> you go there, you read emails and you respond to them. So I did that for several months, applied for over 100 jobs, didn't get anybody to interview me. Um, and I'm just kind of sitting here like, God, you know, I remember asking in October of 2016, I was like, you're not opening any doors for me. You have literally not allowed anybody to interview me. And I know you, I'm a woman of faith. I know you can open doors for me. And I said, Are you trying to tell me I'm supposed to start my own law firm? Because literally, I was like, there's nothing else that makes sense. Right. And when I, when I dared to ask the question, that's when I got this peace that passed all understanding. Um, and I, knew, I knew what that meant. I knew what that meant when I got that. And I said, oh, my God, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I want to just work for I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just I didn't. I didn't have a tangible example of that. Um, there was nobody I could speak with about entrepreneurship. Yeah, I saw people who worked and they worked at the same company for a really long time and they had a good job and that was it. That was my goal. And, um, but I said, fine. <laughs> when I got the piece, I said, fine. And I'm, I'm driving my baby to a doctor's office and I'm just speaking out loud to God. And I know people are she okay? Um, and uh, I said, fine. I said, but I'm not calling it the law office of Takora Davis. So one lesson that I did get from the job that I got <laughs> from, uh, was he would always say, you have to brand yourself. You can't just call yourself by your name. You need to be known as some type of attorney for marketing, right? And I'm like, oh. Okay. So I knew. I was like, I'm not calling it the law office of Takora Davis because I don't want people to say, what kind of law do you practice? Who do you serve all the time? I said, God, what am I going to call myself? You know, and I heard his voice and he said, you're my lawyer, the creator's lawyer. Ah, I love that. So, you know, people are like, oh, you're a lawyer for creatives. I'm like, no, my, my name is a double entendre. It has a double meaning. I'm God's lawyer, and this is God's law firm, and I happen to also serve people who are creative. Um, so that from a trademark perspective, God was pretty strategic because it actually helped Mark. So um, that's really, I, I, I just stepped out on faith. Again, did not have any experience began to teach myself trademark law. I volunteered, I got like two pro bono clients and I filed their trademarks them, <laughs> for them. Um, I read the entire application, which is a lot to read. And I just was like, you know what, God, I think you're just gonna reward me for just stepping out on faith. And what ended up happening was I launched the firm. And a week after I launched the firm, I got a phone call from VH1 and they said, hey, we need an attorney to be on the show called Black Ink Crew. And we need someone to to counsel someone on, um, and so you know it went from that to to other things just opening up to me just because I happen to say you know what I don't have it all together, 
<laughs> right. But I'm just going to step out on faith and I'm going to trust and believe that God is going to meet my need as I go along. And that's exactly what happened. So I ended up getting into this area of law. It's not like this strict, it's just this path that winded and had hills and valleys. But ultimately, I knew in my heart what I wanted and I went after it. And along the way, I just had various people and programs and opportunities open up to me because I was on the path to my purpose. I love that. I love that. And actually, it's this perfect segue because I wanted to ask you about something I read in your book. Oh, gosh. Planted to Protein. Yeah. I'm always honored when people are like, I read your book. I'm like, you know yes. Oh my God. <laughs> my husband, he was like, you know, Carrington, I think I think you like this book. And at first I was like, you know, okay, yeah. But when I started reading, I was like, oh, this is really, really good. And mm-hmm. I love how vulnerable you are in it and um, how transparent you are about some of the um, the, the struggles and even the insecurities you had. But do you mind if I read a section no, from nice. page 34? You said you were at church, and I guess a little background, uh, you're, you were supposed to open the law firm, your plan was open in August of 2017. Uh, yeah, but you, yeah. But you opened it in January of, um, not January, yeah, January of 2017. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons you pushed it up is you got a prophetic word mm-hmm. um, at church, and um, the apostle, he said, do you mind if I read it? No, yeah. <laughs> okay. To Cora, God says to make haste. Open your law firm as fast as you can. God will send you clients from all over the country and all over the world. The time is now for you to move. You will not fail. And what I loved, that, that really kind of um, stuck out to me because he said to make haste. And I think it's interesting when um, when God tells you to do something, it's so, I think as humans, it's so easy to convince ourselves like, okay, I'll obey, but you kind of obey some of it. Yeah. Or you kind of, you know, you procrastinate, which you talk a lot about in this book, which I, I love that you talk about procrastination. But, you know, you kind of, you know, and if you would not have been obedient, opened it and actually made haste and didn't just like, like, okay, I hear that. Um, hmm. and, and cause if you would have opened in April and not in January or in May, you would have missed that opportunity because literally five days, like you said, I think five days later, you got the call from VH1. So that was not, and, and it really could have changed your whole trajectory. Yeah. And I think people don't understand how God works. It, what, it wouldn't been like your company would have been a failure, but you don't know. It may not have been as successful as it is now if you don't have the connections that you make. Exactly. And timing is so important. So I think our audience, I, I really wanted them to um, to really hear about that point because I I think it's so important that when God told you to do something, don't procrastinate or find excuses or let fear hold you back. And if you waited till August, really that wasn't in a in I guess um in sense knowledge that would have been kind of the normal thing to do it makes sense i think you mentioned your son would have been about your old and no yep. one would have looked at you funny for that like i mean it's opening a law firm it's not exactly like oh, i'm gonna go to mcdonald's it's a right. lot of work and and to push it up from that to january i mean you have been no one could have would have looked at you funny but you probably would have missed out on a really great opportunity oh i'm sure because it was perfectly aligned you know and what's interesting about that is, I'm happy you brought that up, is you're right, I, I launched, I really was like, you know what, God, I hear you, I'm going to be obedient, I will open the law firm. I'm gonna plan to open it in August of next year. And here's why I said that, I said, I'm gonna prepare, I'm gonna study trademark law, because I felt like I needed to study and really get up, build up this confidence in myself so I could be worthy to serve. Right. Good. I think if I would have kept doing that, it probably would prolonged it. Maybe I'll do it two years from now. Right. And that's why I would have kept getting moved back. So literally, God has to just interrupt my plan, yep. <laughs> my pastor. And then my, and I'm just like, when, that was the first time someone had prophesied to me. Mm, okay. I prophesied to before. And that, that was really a new concept for me. But literally, I felt God and I felt the urgency and the weight. And I literally, in December, getting my LLC paperwork together, calling the bar. Like these were things that I just wasn't prepared for. And I launched and I just was like, you know what? I have like an extra couple hundred bucks. My husband, I got like, I built my own website. I got a 
subscription to Photoshop. Why? I don't know. Well, I got Photoshop. No, I got <laughs> my onboarding, right? And so that was really, and I put together my logo in Photoshop, right? And so I posted that and literally my former trial team coach, Stephen Corby, is a really great family law attorney in Charlotte. And he said, hey, Takora, I went to, um, I just gave your number to a producer at VH1. And I'm like, what? He was like, I went to high school with someone who's a producer. And he reached out to me and he asked me, you know, do I know somebody? And he was like, I just saw you open your law firm. And this, I knew you'd be great for this opportunity. He said, I know that you and the guy you used to work for, you both practice this type of law. He was like, but I don't like him. <laughs> Sorry, Steven. He said, I don't like him. So I ain't giving him this opportunity. I was like, oh, great. And so that's how it happened. It was, you know what? I remember just posting my logo being like, oh my gosh, I'm just posting this. I'm putting it out here. I created a press release, you know, and it was just being obedient. Like many of us know that we are supposed to do something that is far beyond the scope of where we are right now. And we don't exactly know how it's going to happen. Like there's no way that you can say all of these things are going to align that's going to allow me to have this dream. But you just have to start taking the the acts of faith and the steps of faith. Because faith is an action thing, like working faith. It's not enough to just think it and believe it. I believe you have to put movement um, in your faith. And so that's what I had to do. And I was incredibly scared, incredibly insecure. Um, and now sitting here five and a half years later and I'm like I filed by the grace of God over 1,000 trademarks I have a 98.5% success rate the people that went to the law schools that I was denied and rejected from that I could wow. not get into they come to me now and they ask me for advice you know, wow. so, you know it's a humbling thing for me to think and God had to do it that way but he was like people are going to know when they hear your story that it was nothing but God. I really can't credit. I have worked very hard, no doubt, but God has really orchestrated and he has found favor with me by opening up amazing opportunities for me and for me to just apply and bring my whole self to the table. I don't, I couldn't bring ego to the table like other lawyers where I say, oh, I went to Harvard or I went to Yale, right? I, I couldn't share that because that, the name of my school didn't carry that weight, right? The same weight in society. You know, I couldn't carry, well, I've worked at a law firm for X amount of years and I have all this experience with trademarks. I couldn't do that. And so my mentor at the time, her name's Courtney Rhodes, you know, I said, Courtney, I just, I know I need to do it, but I just don't, I just don't know if are people gonna trust me? You know, I, I don't know. And she, she said to Cora, she said, are you going to do, are you going to take people's money and not do the work? I was like, no, of course not. I'd never do that. I, I'm always going to do the work. She was like, are you going to be honest if you make a mistake? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be honest if I make a mistake. She was like, that's what people care about. People care. Are you going to work and operate in integrity? And are you going to do the best that you can do for them and be honest? If you do that, you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. You know, I just, I, there are so many ways, so many times that we can just entertain excuses that yes. other people are not even thinking about. Nobody's asking me what law school I went to. Nobody's asked me some of these things that I was so worried about. That was my own ego. I love that. You know, I think there's something to be said um, about not having it all together. Cause I think with so many things in life, if you wait till everything's perfect, <laughs> you won't ever do it, right? Like you'll always just kind of, procrastinate something will always come up something will and so I love that you if you think about it it really is kind of remarkable that you really didn't have the experience and you went and did, you made a law firm like that you found a law firm most people would think that's like almost like wow that's ridiculous you should work for so many years in this way and and I love that your story really brings the glory to God because Oftentimes, the Lord can do stuff with people who aren't necessarily qualified in that sense. He qualifies. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think there's something to be said about that, um, about not having everything perfect and, and not having, um, you know, not having maybe all the credentials. But like what you said, you work hard, you have the integrity, and you knew God called you to do it. So you knew he, he gave you the grace to do it, the talent to do it. And, and you set out and 
he did it. And wow, I, I, it, it's really amazing that in five years, because my daughter, she'll be five uh, later this month. So five years just feels like that. Right. right. I look at my son who's six. And so he was, you know, the law firm launched when he was six and a half or seven months. And so as he grows and he goes through these different changes. Yeah. Funny because I look at my business and you can be, we can be so hard on ourselves. Yeah. And sometimes your business is a toddler, <laughs> right? You look at a business like you should know the business should be able to bring in leads how it needs to bring in. The business should be able to generate revenue. And it's like, would you really look at your five or six year old and be like, you should know how to have, you should know how to do biochemistry. You know? Right, right. No, that's just a, that's just a, a terrible measure to measure someone by. And so I have to sometimes be gracious with myself because five years is not a very long time of being in business. Now it's longer than many people because of most businesses, I think they fail within the first three years. Right? So after you get over that three year hump, that's something to be said, right? But still there's so much more to learn uh, and to leverage along the way. Yeah. Um, I have a question because um, I want to know in your field, oftentimes I think when we think of a lawyer, the first image that pops our mind, unfortunately, is um, a white male or a <laughs> male in general. Do you find being a black woman and not just a black woman, but you're a black woman to me that has um, a youthfulness to you, you know, and an attractiveness to you. And I think, do you ever find that people don't take you seriously sometimes? Like they think, oh, OK, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is just a natural thing. Sometimes it happen and you have to, I've had that happen a couple of times, particularly with, with various people. But one of the things, if someone told me this, um, they said, you know, one of your greatest strengths, he said, you're disarming. And I said, what? You know, he said, and it really disarming me. I agree. People underestimate you. I think because you have a sweet voice or a soft voice or that you're not like this loud and big person. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, that you don't take up a lot of space in a room, that you're not powerful. And so um, I have been underestimated. That has often worked out in the favor of myself and my clients. Um, so it, it happens that way. But I think we have to just have, <laughs> I remember I was doing something for a client and they just were just, um, she had, she basically was purchasing property, um, and this was underneath the general counseling services arm of the business. She had pur purchased property, and she had made a payment. I didn't like the contract, but this client signed a contract anyway. Um, and um, there was a provision in the contract that she was supposed to make a lot more payments. So she had made a partial payment, like 50%, and then another 10%. And they were like, you need to pay the other 40%. You haven't done that. and you know. He was like, this is a breach of contract and you don't get access to the condo. And I'm like, dude, like she's paid like a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know. And so she made another partial payment. And then he was like, I said, listen, we need written assurance that you were going to hold up your end of the bargain and give her access to the condo. And, you know, they were saying, well, we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that. And I just said, you know what? And I just had to just turn it up. I had to turn the knob up a little bit. And I was like, according to the rules of the contract, I said, I'm going to interpret your acceptance or continue acceptance of funds is that you're going to continue to actually honor the agreement and you're not actually rescinding the agreement despite what you're saying because your actions indicate otherwise. Therefore, she's going to finish making up this payment and you can give me written assurance, but we're going to interpret it this way because your behavior is, is as such. Thank you and have a good day. And I had to just be firm, you know, and sometimes that's what's necessary. And so, yeah, I've been underestimated a lot. And I think I have, not I think, I know I have the spiritual gift of grace and mercy. And people who have spiritual gifts of grace and mercy, you also are, are heavy, heavily gifted with the spiritual gift of discernment. A lot of times your discernment can be attacked because you have a dysfunctional grace. And this is just me stepping into the prophetic, but this is like people who are like, oh, God will reveal to you that person doesn't like you, or this person means you harm, or, you know, 
when per this person made this statement, it was with ill intent. And then sometimes if you have that gift, you can say, oh, that's a terrible thing to think about that person. I, I don't want to be mean. It's like, no, like <laughs> the, the discernment is actually there for you to protect you. Right. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I say that I don't even know why I got into that particular part, but it's important because that those those are are things where sometimes you can attract people who are manipulative sometimes even clients you know, or colleagues and things like that you have to just very you have to, i think this has been the greatest journey of self-awareness for me being an entrepreneur and a mother and just being myself at this phase in my life of understanding like who i am and what do i attract and how do i also protect myself i'm all about protecting people's businesses but how do you protect yourself as you're building and growing your own business too i love that and i and i will say i think um i think you're approachable and i think you're you come you're friendly i think and so i think to me, it will work as a benefit. If I'm a client, I'd much rather have a lawyer on my side who I think, who I don't feel like is automatically judging me or abrasive. So I think if someone says you're disarming to me, I, I think that I don't think that's a bad thing. But I can understand how people could try to use that and be, yeah, and act like they can pull one on you. And yeah. that's not. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, and first of all, with all the attorneys in the United States, I think it's about five percent of them are African American, right? right? And then the, so that's not a large percentage. But the type of law that I practice is less than two percent. It's one point oh eight, which is about five hundred and fifty black. I think it's, yeah, black men and women attorneys who practice intellectual property law. So we're not even just saying black women, just black people in general. So that's even wow. Yeah, it's not a lot. But then I am serving the fastest growing population of entrepreneurs. You know, and so many black women who are launching businesses and creating things, whether it be podcasts, you know, which is a, a booming industry, or, or it could be coaching or something in finance, um, restaurant tours, right? There are multiple black women and black folks just in general who are launching businesses at scale and traditionally you have not always had access to intellectual property and business attorneys who also look like you and so i try to take a culturally relevant and culturally competent approach to legal representation because that matters and i'm doing something that is very unique uh, because many of the trademarks, you know, the United States Patent and Trademark is Office, whether people want to admit or not, is an inherently racist system. It's just systemically racist. Uh, but black folks couldn't even own intellectual property or file right. that, that intellectual property in the early 1900s. Uh, when enslaved Africans were freed, the last thing that the slave owners took from them was the rights to their intellectual property and their patent. So, we have this system where some of my clients, their trademarks have had the word black in them because it may indicate maybe black love or black this or black that. And the trademark office has tried to refuse registration altogether. Oh, oh it's too descriptive. So if your trademark is descriptive, um, they can say it can be refused. But I think there's a blackness is not just a, a, a people, it's a, a a race is a culture right <laughs> you know yeah. right and so there are certain nuances and so when they try to refuse some of my clients trademarks i have to actually educate practitioners and say you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people that are the core audience these folks are not going to be confused because as a part of their culture they understand certain things there's a cultural context when they experience a trademark you know, and I have to, had to explain that. Like I had a trademark called the photo cookout for a client, Dr. Tamaya Cole. And they were saying, we want to refuse this trademark registration. She can register on a less powerful registry, which is the supplemental, because um, the photo cookout sounds like a, a, a fine dining experience for photographers. So I literally had to tell them that the cookout is not a real place. Yeah. <laughs> 
a colloquialism. A cookout is a colloquialism in the African American community where it is a safe place to congregate to discuss various things. And and if we feel safe with you, we may or may not invite you to the cookout. Right? It is not literally a fine dining experience for photographers. <laughs> so I had to explain that to them. Right? But if you don't have a culturally relevant application. If you're a legal practitioner and you can't use that insight to be right. able to provide that level of support to your client, you are doing a disservice to the client by not advocating for them zealously and holistically. And so you, then you have coupled that with the fact that you have less than 2% of attorneys that practice this type of law. So not everybody even is applying it in that particular way. And so I realized, I was like, oh, I need to... I provide culturally relevant legal representation and culturally relevancy has been applied in pedagogy and education and things of that nature. But I said, let me take that and put it towards my legal representation to make sure I really understand and I can fully advocate for my clients. I did the same type of application, <laughs> to the same type of argument for another client that I won an argument for in Living Curls. And so the trademark examiner was saying, oh, it's too similar to In Living, which is a, a, ma a, a magazine in Amsterdam. But In Living Curls is a wordplay. It's a pun from In Living Color. And In Living Curls is a blog and a business that provides a holistic education to African-American women who are battling hair loss. The intended audience is not going to be confused with In Living, which is a magazine when you travel to Amsterdam. Yeah. Right? Not right? even. <laughs> you know? And so the, the trademark examiner, she called me, she was like, hello. Um, you know, she was like, uh, I, I just finished reading the, the argument for In Living Curls. That, that was a great argument, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I, I love the argument. I, I love the In Living Color reference. I'm going to I'm gonna overturn it in your client's favor. But it was because I was able to say, okay, from she un needs to understand the cultural context when interpreting this trademark. And some of our less melanated brethren are not going to do that unless we step in and we say hey are you looking at it from this perspective so this is that's another unique lens in which i provide legal support and legal services is not like other people you know i was going to ask other than um the stuff you've already mentioned what what other reasons should people go to your law firm um like what distinguishes you from other law firms in your field yeah, yeah. I think that's that's a major one with the culturally relevant representation and the success rate. But let's just say, putting all that aside, I am also an entrepreneur. I am I have employees. I have grown and scaled a business. I have had to hire, I've had to fire, I've had to grow, I had to scale, I had to scale back. And so when I represent people, they come to me and they're not just getting an attorney, you're getting a strategist. You're getting someone who is going to walk with you throughout the entire road. You're also gonna get someone who I, I spoke with someone the other day and I said, hey, you should not pursue this trademark. They hadn't even paid me any money. You know, I'm just like, hey, it's not, this is not a smart move for you for these reasons. One, you're probably not gonna get the trademark. Two, it's gonna be very costly for you to defend even if you did get it, right? Me saying to you, hey, with integrity, I can't take your money because this is a good fit for you. I will t I've told people that numerous times. It's going to come back to me. And they're so appreciative because a lot of times they feel like, oh, my gosh, I have to, you know, um, oh, you know, I, I've got to I got to figure this out or, you know, I need this. And it's like, hey, no. The other thing I think, um, this is something new that we're really getting ready to roll out is God has given me this amazing tool and it's called the Creator's Compass. And so the Creator's Compass, which you'll be able to download, but um, and we're gonna actually start um, sharing this resource with other folks, but people who hire me, they get a very beautiful welcome box, but that compass is inside of it. And the compass is a navigational tool that every entrepreneur can use, whether they're at zero dollars in revenue or they've scaled all the way to one million. And literally you can find where you are on this compass in terms of revenue. And I tell you exactly what legal steps that you need to take to protect your business. I believe that your legal doesn't have to be complicated. And so we endeavor to uncomplicate the complex 
because leadership is challenging and we just need to make it easy. And so I speak with you and I say, okay, hey, you might say to Cora, I made $50,000 in revenue. Well, on the compass, that means that you're in the very first column, which is you're a starter. Your primary legal question is, where do I start? Almost everybody says, well, where do I start? Like, I don't even know where I get started, right? And I say, okay, well, you have to focus on the contracts, courses, and biz resources that are going to support your business. And so there's, I even give a checklist right here and you literally can go through and get your contract templates and say, okay, these are the exact contract templates that I need at minimum at this phase of the business. Um, And I also talk about, you know, the mental issues or not mental issues, but like your money questions, your primary money questions. If you haven't made six figures is how do I make my first six figures? Right. And what to focus on. That means you have to focus on a couple of different things to get ready for that. There's some mental hurdles that you have to go through at that phase, but I'm endeavoring to not just address one singular problem with it, which is, you know, registering your trademarks, even though that's my flagship offer. We have these resources and tangible tools that we are developing and we're getting ready to roll out over the next couple of months. Um, so this is, you know, when you listen to this, well, I'm rec- we're recording this in October of 2022, but we're rolling things out this month and next month saying, hey, if you're an entrepreneur, we have something for you to be able to support you. And I don't think other law firms are doing it on this level. Um, and I think you know I just know what I'm doing and I'm called to serve the whole entrepreneur and really make sure that you understand what's happening because it's so much bigger than a trademark even though that's pretty darn big there are so many things that can happen in business that can stop your purpose I'm a purpose activator I'm a purpose accelerator and so when I look at the law that's just my area in the body of Christ that I work in because I know that God gives his children and his those who he has created with creativity, which is why we go forth and we create things that he puts on our heart to do. But what can stop our creativity is legal targets that are on our businesses back. Mm. I'm able to help remove legal targets from your brand's back and you feel that you have the legal protection that you need to create with freedom. You will move forward and you will impact the lives or it's much more likely that you will because you have these things in place. And I'm hitting it on every revenue level. So you might say, okay, I'm making between 100 and 300,000, but there's a certain step level of legal steps that you need to take when you're there. When you're from 500 to 700,000, you need to make sure there's a different type of legal protection you need to have in place, but it's difficult to figure out exactly what that is and what it looks like if you don't have a guide. And that's what the compass does. The compass is a navigational tool that helps guide you through the um, legal and mental challenges on your road to protecting your business and trademarking your legacy. So I'm very different from other people because of that too. (laughs) I love, see, I would love something like that because I'm not, you know, into legalese. I don't really know all of the terms and all. And so for me, I would love something because you almost will feel like someone's holding your hand and guiding you through it. Oh, I think that's brilliant. Um, I want to, um, I want to know what are some misconceptions people have about trademark and patenting? What do they call that? Poor man's trademark? Patent or poor man's trademark. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions. So one of them is that you can, you know, get a level of legal protection if you mail your idea to yourself, right? And so, or you mail your invention idea to yourself. And that's really in terms of whether people believe it or not, there's, there's actually never been any type of legal support to that theory. There's never been anything where in history but that's actually been honored, despite rappers from the 80s saying that they mail their tapes to themselves. Yes. Like, yeah, I've heard, and in all fairness, she's not the only one. I've heard that for years. Right. So many celebrities you get a, Right, so that's not even necessary because the moment that you create creative content, you own it. So the moment that someone records a song, copyright attaches. The moment that somebody records a podcast, copyright attaches. The moment that you post a website, copyright attaches. So you don't need to mail it to yourself to prove uh, the mailing date. You just have to, that it just is, right? So that's not necessary. Further, it can be used against you in court (laughs) because 
you know, if you if you do it, you may as well email something to yourself. Why, why put it in the mail and then mail it to yourself? But it still is the same rationale. It's not necessary because we actually have a system in this country that you can use to protect your business, which is the trademark system or the patent system or the copyright system. So you mail people created an alternative thinking that they had a workaround, which is why they call it a poor man's patent, you know. And again, you know, that could technically work against you in court because now patent law, we've moved to a first to file system, um, not a first to invent. So generally, um, well, it's still a first to invent, but you have to file it like if you publish it. So that means put it in the mail and you send it off. Technically, that could be construed as publishing, you know, arguably. And if you don't patent it, then you can lose the right to your patent if you don't file it appropriately, right? So somebody mailing it to themselves is not sufficient. Further, the trademark doesn't work that way because you have to either file a trademark application or you have to, um, yeah, you have to file a trademark application or you actually have to make sales or provide the service or publish the podcast, whatever it is. If you don't do one of those two things, it's not yours. It's, it's not your name at all. And it's, it's it, that mail is, oh, hey, I put this in a, a sealed envelope. Further, you can unseal and seal an envelope. So that also is not, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so there's all these holes that I'm like poking in these arguments where I'm like, you could totally unseal an envelope. Like, that's not something where someone is gonna, the judge is gonna say, yep. I'm gonna hang my hat on that, right? Um, so it's just, that's a legal myth. The other legal myths I think are, um, there's several of them, but uh, okay. So I would say, um, you know, I just don't have enough money to protect my business, right? Um, or it's gonna cost too much money to protect my brand. Like I, I had a, I was interviewed by Forbes and I spoke about this in an article and you can get, trademark services for free if you qualify, meaning you aren't making enough money or you are indigent, right? And that means that you can get a legal clinic, a law school clinic, where law students will work on your trademark application for you. And actually those trademark applications are expedited. They're gonna be looked at in like maybe 30 days. Why? Right. Because the law <laughs> students hear <you're> back. <laughs> they want their grades, right? So that is a an agreement that the clinics have with those law schools to expedite those trademark applications much faster because the students are actually doing it um, under the supervision of attorney, right? So. You can do that. You can go to pro bono route and reach out to your state bar because some attorneys will volunteer their time. So when people say, you know, it's going to cost way too much, why don't you look at those particular options first and foremost? Second, it, it, is it, it costs a whole lot more to have to rebrand than to file a trademark application. I had a client and they were sued for trademark infringement or got a cease and desist. They had to stop and pause business operations for 30 days. Oh no. <laughs> they had to rebrand. They had to re rewrap their trucks because they were doing like, uh, they actually they actually installed my hutch back here. Um, so they did that work back there, but they had to do a whole bunch of stuff, right? And uh, they had to order new business cards. They had to turn over their domain name to the other company. So all the traffic wow. that they want to their business now goes to the other company. <laughs> so you're starting to start compute, like how much does this cost in my head? So immediately they ended up having to pay $25,000 to rebrand very quickly, right? And it was rushed. Not to mention that they couldn't take on any other clients for that time because it was infringement. So say it costs too much to my, protect my brand. It costs a whole lot more to have to rebrand at the height, right? Um, and there's alternatives for you if you feel that you cannot afford to make the investment. Um, I think another myth is that you having a registered trademark will immediately stop copycats. That's just not true. The trademark is the way that you declare a legal ownership over the business, right? Or the product name, program name, right? But it's your duty as the owner of the trademark to stop other people. So if somebody else is using it, you need to do what you can to get that stuff pulled down, whether it be, hey, I'm going to pull down uh, their Instagram names or their social media handles or this or that, right? Um, 
The other thing is it's too complicated to, um, like it's too early. That's the other one. It's too early to invest in protecting your brand, right? So people say, well, I'm just trying to see how this goes. Okay, I had a client and she finally got her products in Target and she was so excited, you know, cause that's like when you have a product-based business and you get it on or shelves, people are like, that's finally what I wanted. She gets there, she's making these sales, then her trademark is challenged, she gets a cease and desist from another company and they're like, we want you to pull all of your products off the shelves, we want you to completely and totally rebrand. Now she's spending time, energy, and effort fighting them. Oh if she trademarked her business, if she would have trademarked her business in the first three years, she would have had a registration. And you you might say, well, Decor, how do you know that? The company didn't start to challenge all these trademarks until the year prior. So if she would have moved faster and earlier, she would have been in a much better position. Right? They're starting to try because some companies. That what happened was the previous company was acquired by a much larger company. So when you have a much larger company, they know the value of their intellectual property. They go after and they protect it with a vengeance. That's why they're trying to cancel all these trademarks that are similar to theirs. The names aren't even identical. They're similar, right? Um, I think the final myth is that you can't have the same business name as someone else. That's just not true. You can as long as the products or services you're offering are really marketed to a different class of consumers or they're offered in a different industry. So for example, we have Pandora Music, Pandora Jewelry, Dove Chocolate, Dove Soap, yeah. uh, Delta Airlines, Delta Faucets, right? And so those are what I like to call brand twins. So just because you do see another business out there with the same name as you, that doesn't mean that you stop there. You dig a little deeper and you kind of say, okay, are the type of products and services I'm offering any way similar to theirs? And if so, you know, what do I do about it? I love that. Well, um, my last question for anyone out there who, um, who's kind of like you in the sense that they had a lot of obstacles, people who doubted them. They they know they're called to do something, um, but maybe they're battling insecurities or thoughts, seeds that were planted. Like, mm, you, you, maybe you shouldn't do that because I, you know, I should backtrack a little bit. In your book, <laughs> you talk about how, um, I think, and I hope I get this story right. Um, you were, with your grades, you weren't doing so well, I believe in, what was it? Not law school, but in, undergrad <laughs> undergrad yes and yeah. so before and so the man who was supposed to help you with your admissions into law school was kind of discouraging you so you know that that's tough if you have because it's already hard enough sometimes just dealing with whatever insecurities you do have but then when other people are doubting you that that can be tough um and some people just kind of naturally have a brush it off but for other people and i think for most people you know, we can be filled with faith and all of that, but sometimes, you know, we're human. We have moments where we have, we battle that sometimes of, uh, am I, am I good enough? Will this person, can, will they really trust me with this? How, how what could you speak to, uh, what could you say, I should say to someone like that who's kind of battling that? Yeah. Yeah. I, and for context, again, I almost flunked out of undergrad. I was placed on academic warning because my GPA was in such jeopardy. And I was just going, I was experiencing, uh, uh, really I was trying to work through some trauma. That's pretty yeah. much what happened, right? And so that was the context behind that. And so when whenever you're getting out of a pit, there's always gonna be some dirt that gets on you. You know, and so I'm climbing out of this pit and I'm finally trying to place my feet on solid ground. And sometimes if you could imagine like digging out of a hole and trying to grasp onto the side of the hole and climbing up, dirt is gonna get in your face. And so I just kind of think of his comments like that. It was just dirt getting in my face and I had to brush it off and ask myself, well, gosh, I just got a little bit of dirt on me. Does that mean that I belong in the pit or does that mean that I need to continue to climb my way out? Come on, that's so, Ultimately, that was my resolve. Like, despite what he said um, and the judgments he made against me, he didn't even have all the information and the facts to make a proper judgment. That's further, further, he didn't even have the power to tell me yes. He wasn't sitting on a law school admissions board. Right. He wasn't grading a law school test. He didn't have the power to tell me yes. So I certainly wasn't going to allow him the power to tell me no. 
And so as I think about things in life and if someone is saying, gosh, I'm in a position where I just don't see a way out. I'm trying to get out of this pit. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. And people have all these things to say about me and to me. Just know a little bit of dirt is going to get on you as you climb out. But do not give people more power over your life than they deserve. And take from conversations and from people what you need and discard the trash where it belongs. I remember when I spoke with a guy, he was trying to tell me, well, it's going to be very difficult for you to get in law school. You have a tough, I looked at him, I said, I did my GPA before you did, before I walked in here. Now, what I need to hear from you is what are the law school requirements and what do I need to do? And he kind of sat down, he shut up and he turned to his computer and he gave me what I needed. I don't need a lecture from you to tell me that it's going to be tough for me. I already know that. That's my reality. I've been black all my life. It right. ain't been any and life for me ain't been no crystal stair, right? But what I need from you is the information that I'm coming to get. And I think that's how I moved through life. When I was in that tough job, I say, you know what? What information do you need to get? Try to get as much as you can from this person, which was how do you practice trademark law? But God made sure that I didn't need to learn how to practice trademark law from him. I needed to see how to run a business. That's why I was there. And I began to realize, oh, you need systems. You need you need to have good customer service. You need to have good, um, you need to make sure that you can pay people well. I began to see all the things that he was doing wrong. And I wasn't there long, but I was there long enough to know what not to do and what environment I shouldn't create and to realize that that was the alternative for some women and men in the workplace. And so, you know, again, go into situations and make sure you know what your intentions are. And no matter what someone tries to say to dissuade you, remember what you are there to get and get it, no matter what, how much dirt people throw on you along the way. Wow, so many gems. Um, wow, this was just an awesome, awesome interview. Um, thank you so much. I was just taking it all in. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I have nothing else to say or anything else to try to add on to that. Um, I encourage you all, I'm gonna leave her information at the end. So take down the information, her website, um, follow her on social media, um, and it's the Creators Law Firm. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm very Thank you for encouraging people to buy this. It's a really good book. I, I Yeah, I mean, it really is. I'm not just like flattering you or anything like that. I, I think it's one of those, I think sometimes you like a little pick me up, like a little, you know what? Yeah, I can do this. Yeah. And I think it's one of those books that kind of makes you feel like I'm going to just step out and do that. It gives you a little kick and a little touch. Man, thank you so much. I, I really don't promote that book like I should. And people people will tell me, oh, I, they'll say, I read your book in a whole day. I yeah. read it again for the third time. I'm like, what? Like, And I wrote that book uh, two months after my father passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It was, it was like, I just didn't, I, it was amazing. You know, I've always said I want to write a book, but I actually sat there and I wrote it, um, you know, and I, it was a really, I think it was a, it was a letter to me. <laughs> it was, it was a reminder for me as well. It was a beautiful thing, but it has been, that's also my passion, being able to inspire people and push them into their purpose. And Planted to Produce does just that. It really helps to push people into their purpose and impart confidence and courage because that's what we need along the way. And so I think that's why throughout my life, my courage and my confidence has been attacked because on the other side of that is freedom. Yes. You know? There's a, there's a really great great quote that I would love to read, leave everyone with, and I think it's from Guy Patton or George Patton, and it says, the difference between fear and courage is that courage holds on just a little bit longer. Mm, you really that. think about it. Whenever you have to get courage, you experience fear, but you do it anyway. Yeah. And so the book is just a gift of courage to people who are facing a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation and a lot of overwhelm and oh, just rapid thoughts and, and uh, overwhelming thoughts and anxiety to say, you know what, you can do it. You just need a little bit of courage. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you all so much for joining me and watching another episode of Inspire with Carrie. If you or, um, or if you know anyone else that you think would be an excellent guest for this show and has an inspiring story, please 
to let me know. You can contact me at the information you'll see at the end of this episode. So again, one last time, attorney Takora Davis. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.